Hey everyone, welcome to today's episode of Questioning Behavior. And the behavior we're questioning today is how representative behavioral science really is. You're the dummy that don't believe in science. All your projects always be denying. You're the dummy. We have a lot of cool results within this field, but are they actually truly generalizable? Does what we know hold in the West actually hold in, for example, India or Australia or Sub-Saharan Africa? Sarah, what do you think? Well, th this is essentially our title. Is behavioral science weird? Capital W-E-I-R-D. Uh, and the answer is yes. yes. It is very weird. It is very Western. It's so weird. So uh, we'll actually dive into this a bit more with someone who knows much more about it. But weird is actually, we're not just trying to be like funny or punny or whatever, but weird is actually a very commonly used acronym uh, for those that study uh, representativeness uh, of sciences or just representativeness of any field, where weird stands for Western educated... Industrialized, rich, and democratic, uh, which is a reflection Oof. on the country or society that you're from. And when we look into behavioral science, or at least if I look at the sample pool that the, that I call my participants, mm -hmm. you could argue that they are exactly that. Right. I think most of the people I have in my sample pool, they are at least very, very wealthy because they're in university. Let's not pretend that they're poor. Um, they're predominantly white. I mean, they're yeah. in university, so you could argue that they're educated. I mean, I'm sure still still a few of them are actually quite moronic, but, you know, they're, they're educated. And um, mm -hmm. <laughs> just shots fired at my own participants. A bit harsh, but, you know, it is what <laughs> it is. But, yeah. Well, it's a very, very often cited criticism of lab experiments and experimental economics mm. that we predominantly only use a sample of students right, in all of our experimental studies. But what's interesting is that we don't, really hear that criticism extended, you know, into, I guess, the bigger picture, True. right, is that we're only really sampling people who have grown up in these weird countries. And what we know about culture is that culture and behavior are, are tied very, very closely together. Mm -hmm. And right? there's, there's, I guess, there's been lots and lots of proposed mechanisms through which culture affects behavior, such as, you know, ingrained beliefs, values, social norms and traditions, it, you know, it's quite easy to conceptually, you know, draw the link between why someone uh, who's grown up within another culture might behave differently or perceive, you know, even the, the choice environment differently. Yeah, no, you're absolutely right. The papers that used to have these smaller samples wherein, you know, there's a, I don't know, 47 uh, male undergraduates in, like you said, an experimental economics lab study, these kind of papers, you know, who, who hasn't grown up with them, uh, we certainly have. But mm -hmm. I don't see those papers as much anymore. I think it would be very, very difficult to get them published nowadays. So there, there has been a change. But I think a lot of that change is driven by big data. Whereas in why would you test something on 47 people if you could get third-party 30, 30 data uh, in which you have, you know, four, 400,000 uh, people and you can follow and track their behavior uh, by proxy or, or almost literal, which is, which is great. You know, that's, that's a good development. Um, I do think findings become more robust as a result of it. But of course, if these 400,000 people are highly educated white British people, again, there, there's, there's questions to be asked as to whether what they what they uh, show to do or we you know the the results that are drawn from their behavior mm. and that specific data set whether any of that would replicate to any other country and the answer is probably no yeah and it, this has incredible implications really for the application of behavioral science and behavioral insights outside of the us and the uk i mean mm. Even within weird countries, you know, you could argue that there are cultural differences oh, that should be taken into account. But yeah, I, it's it's a fascinating fascinating subject, and I think it's something once you open your eyes to it, it's very difficult to unsee. Yes, I can imagine that it would be. But this is the this is the thing with culture, which uh, we're going to dive into in a minute. 
I don't think you can open your eyes to it fully because how you would right. approach the study of culture is probably formed by your culture. So after, I think you're after a while, although it is very worthwhile to be aware of your perspective, your background, where you're coming from and your privilege. Of course, people check your privilege. Please do. I do think after a while you're chasing your own damn tail. And I, I should say, in this episode, we do use a little bit of, of terminology. Uh, a lot of the stuff that gets mentioned is relates to DM or JDM, which is judgment and decision making. Um, and a lot of stuff is also, is also derived from social psychology. So if there's any terms that are left unclear at the end of the episode, just pop us a message. Just reach out to us via the socials. I'm going to be more than happy to explain it to you. But it is, of course, nice for our interviewees to not have to explain themselves for every single term <laughs> that they mention. So Yeah. And a- after that disclaimer, we I guess we should move on to talking about someone who knows a lot more about this, uh, which is our expert of the episode. It, we have the privilege of talking to Elena Halonen. Um, I'm sorry if I've just butchered your name, Elena. Very sorry. Uh, Alina is a fantastic person who's done a lot of writing about cross cultural research. So, yeah, Alina is an absolutely great person uh, who is, is a great pract- uh, practitioner in behavioral science, uh, but also in marketing. And the reason that I know Alina is because of how unashamedly critical she is of both marketing and of behavioral science. And one of the criticisms that she has often had of the field being a, a European herself, she's Finnish, uh, is that a lot of the field is very heavily Americanized, which I, uh, I completely agree with her. So uh, yeah, I, uh, I am very happy to introduce uh, this, this colleague, this peer, and actually also the, this friend of mine as, a, as an interviewee. So take it away, Alina. <laughs> Okay, welcome, Alina, to Questioning Behaviour Podcast. It's so great to have you on. Thank you. It's a real pleasure. It's the first episode, isn't it? Ooh. I don't know, actually. One of one of the first episodes, for sure. I think Merle is in charge. You're, of... you're in the top five. In, you're the, in top the top five. five. Yeah, so... <laughs> yep, yep. That's so good. That's, that's fine. All good. <laughs> that's right, yeah. Um, so would you like to introduce yourself to the audience? Give us a little bit of background. Sure. So um, I'm uh, Alina and um, I what I do these days is that I am a freelance behavioral science consultant or uh, behavioral uh, insight strategist or pick a pick a nice title. It doesn't. You know, all of them are, are descriptive. And um, uh, so what I do is I, I currently work with different agencies and different uh, like larger companies, behavior change, uh, marketing, market research and um, work with them to sort of provide the behavioral science consultancy. And before this, I spent uh, seven, eight years running a small market research agency. We specialized in applying behavioral science. So um, that was, um, yeah, we we designed research methods that are were more sort of psychologically accurate and, uh, and also integrated a lot of behavioral science into our recommendations and how we analyze consumer behavior. So yeah, I've been doing this for, I don't know, about 10 years now. Wow. Yeah. Impressive. So how did you actually get into behavioral science? Uh, That's a bit of a complicated story, I suppose. Um, Well, I, uh, the the way I ended up working or founding an agency focusing on behavioral science is that I I met someone at a a friend's birthday party and uh, we started talking about market research. No one ever knows about market research, so it was... um, it was like, oh wow, okay. And uh, over time, we did some um, we did some academic research. We did a couple of little projects on sunk cost effect in different countries, just a very small scale uh, because we were independent and not really have the you know in- uh, institutional support. But anyway, over time, we kind of um, we thought about how we'd improve market research. And uh, he his background was uh, economics, uh, software. And then sort of self-trained behavioral uh, behavioral economist, and um, and over t- over time we sort of uh, we started developing all these methods and developing building this agency. Little by little, I um, uh, well, I, I'd already been I'd already been interested in behavioral science for a very long time. I just didn't quite realize it. It wasn't a thing um, in the market research world. So I I, I basically read uh, psychology books from different areas. Um, 
pretty much probably a good, good 20 years. So when we started, I thought, I don't really know very much, but actually, when, um, you know, he, he encouraged me and said, I think you know more than you think you do. And give it, you know, a couple of years and I was like, oh, actually, mm, I do know a lot of this stuff. I just didn't realize it. And then um, over that sort of seven, seven, eight years, I went to probably 20, 25 um, academic psychology conferences in, in America, in uh, different countries, well, in South Africa, um, uh, in Europe, elsewhere. But a lot of them were the judgment decision making psychology conferences or consumer psychology conferences in America, which were really eye opening and kind of gave me um, gave me an insight into this world that you can't really get from a book. Um, it was mm-hmm. um, I have a lot of friends who who were PhD students back then and they're now assistant professors. And it's a it's really interesting what you what you can learn from um, listening to the, sort of I, I suppose the backstage backstage of of the science. So yeah, um, yeah, and those conferences were almost like a festival of knowledge that you sit there and you know two or three days, 20, 20 talks a day that you watch and. Uh, it, it almost feels like a back catalog of ideas and, and concepts and, and um, things that you can draw on later. Uh, yeah, that's that's kind of how I got into it, and um, I think I've chosen my path now. So it's too <laughs> it's 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 too late now. It's too late now to go anywhere else. It's... Twenty conferences in. If you've done twenty conferences, you're committed. Yeah, there's no turning back. I haven't even done twenty conferences. I honestly find conferences absolutely exhausting. They are quite exhausting, but they're they're also really exciting because there is, um, I mean, you can, reading uh, reading books and articles is, is, is very good, but at the same time, going to mm-hmm. a conference is a totally different experience because, um, of course. especially if you're a practitioner, it's different when you, when you're an actual, actually an academic and you're there, you know, say my friends would, um, my fr- friends would, when they were PhD students, they would go to either their friend sessions or their competitor sessions. Whereas I go to things that I think might be useful for my work or things that are interesting. So I can choose pretty freely what I go to and it's it's kind of a you know relaxed environment and relaxed situation. Um, so I just I just go there to absorb different ideas and making furious notes about uh, like learning new topics that would otherwise not come across. Uh, so when you get a when you get a client project, I'm, I might see 20 talks a day and only one of them might be relevant for a project I'm working right there and then. But give it three months and a con- project comes by and I'm analyzing some, some consumer behavior. And because I've seen and I, I've kind of learned about a certain concept, I can see it in their behavior. And I can then um, like this, this sounds like that talk I, I listened to. And then you go back and, and you can kind of research it once you know what you're looking for. But if you don't even know that something exists, then you can't really, you know, it's difficult to, you can't see it, you can't go and look into it more. And I think that's why the conferences were so good that it's almost like this Rolodex of of ideas and concepts in my mind that, that you know, when I see phenomena, it's like, okay, hold on, let me go through the Rolodex, ding, 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 ding. And then you find the the thing you're look, you're thinking about. So I think that's, conferences are a bit different experience, I think, for me. Slightly, slightly. Also, very quickly for our audience listening, especially those under 30, what is a Rolodex? Oh, uh, well, I don't think I've ever owned one. It's just a, <laughs> it's just a word that I've, uh, I've I've learned over the years. So Rolodex is what we had. I, I suppose Rolodex is what we had before we had smartphones. I don't really know. I don't, <laughs> I've never had one. It's I've I've seen them. I've seen them as like uh, films or whatever. It's, yeah. it, I think it's where you put business cards before, and then you store them, and it's kind of like uh, like a I don't know. I, I'm lacking the words now. Sarah, do you know what I'm talking about? Yeah, you can sort of flick <laughs> through your index. Of your, yes, of that kind of thing. Yeah, that kind of thing, like a carousel of business cards, or I don't know, or recipes. I suppose yeah. that kind of thing. <laughs> I think that's what it is, but maybe, um, yeah. yeah. I mean, I, uh, yeah. <laughs> I'll back you up on that one. Yeah. Good. Okay. Well, the the focus of our podcast today is all about weird behavioral science, which which might sound a little bit odd. So, could you give us a bit of a background? What does weird mean in the context of behavioral science? Yeah, sure. I mean, uh, this is probably one of my my favorite uh, favorite topics. Or you know, uh, depending on the context, it's either my uh, my hobby horse or my pet peeve, depending on where, where I'm at, on the mood. But uh, so weird stands for Western educated, uh, industrialized, rich, and democratic. Where it comes from is this um, 
There was a paper in 2010 by uh, three researchers, Henrik Heinen and Norin Zion, and they did a review of, uh, of various, uh, quite a large uh, range of experiments from behavioral sciences and show that there's a lot of variability in experimental results across different populations, and they really went through lots. Um, and that uh, what they termed weird subjects were actually particularly unusual compared to the rest of our human species. And so they they coined this um, this uh, acronym WEIRD that most of the, so 96% of the, the psychological knowledge that we have, uh, psychology research, is based on 12% of the world's population, which is basically this, this, uh, this acronym WEIRD covered. So Western and educated, um, samples from industrialized, rich, and democratic countries, and so even from and, and then from that twelve percent, out of that twelve percent, it's mostly Americans who are the subject of um, psychological knowledge that it, that is um, perceived to be and sort of in some cases claims to be universal human tendencies. So if you, if you imagine that, you know, 12% of the world's population and actually, you know, two thirds of that 12% uh, of research is actually Americans. So to put it in perspective, an average American, the average American college student ha is 300 times more likely to be the subject of a psychological study than uh, pretty much anyone else in the world. And that that to me is uh, is pretty uh, astonishing. It's quite shocking. That's really where, where weird comes from. Yeah. So, I mean, I guess this suggests that all of our knowledge on biases and behavior is actually biased itself, so to speak. Yeah, it, it kind of is. So, there, um, well, I mean, uh, you don't have to take my word for it. There was a very well-known researcher called uh, Hazel Marcus. She's a uh, hugely, hugely well-cited in social psychology. And uh, she did a keynote uh, speech at... Um, the Society of Consumer Psychology Conference, maybe let's say five years ago, I think it was four or five years ago, and um, and she actually said that uh, pretty much every every effect we know is is probably weird. The I think the bias is uh, the, the sort of cultural bias is even greater in uh, judgment and decision making because um, a lot of the big names and the big uh, labs are based in the U.S. Most of the journals are uh, are. Base, uh, are the editors and the you know associate editors all of that the big societies are all american so having been to those conferences um there are very few europeans maybe max like dozen two dozen maybe or it might be from europe but mostly those conferences and therefore the connections that people make and the, the research that gets done is driven by um uh, by American researchers and research done by uh, on American samples. So it's, yeah, I would I would say that it's really biased. the The problem is that we don't really know how necessarily that research is not. You know, we don't we don't have that. We don't have that yet. Yeah, I mean that that's exciting for future researchers that there's such a, a wealth of knowledge that we haven't really properly investigated yet. It's all still to come. Yeah, and I mean, I um, I used to run this blog uh, called um, Indecision, and um, used to because I ran out of time, and then, uh, but it's still I still pay the I still pay the hosting fee, so it's out there in the world. And there's uh, we used, we did interviews with uh, a lot of big names uh, in in judgment decision making, and one of them was Dan Ariely. Uh, Ariely. And uh, I'm, I'm not. Uh, this is not a verbatim quote because that is on the blog. But he, uh, one of the questions that we asked was, "What do you see as the the challenges for the field in the next ten years?" And he said something to the effect that, you know, we've we've mainly focused on uh, the, like, well, we've been focused on discovering main effects until now, and then the next ten years is is the big challenge is to understand what's the validity of those findings mm -hmm. um, outside of. Uh, the specific cultural context that they were conducted in. So I think, you know, I, I think there's um, a, a, some of the some of the big bigger names that we know they they do appreciate that this is a this is an issue. And I think I really himself has done some research that compares um, West Germans and uh, East Germans, even though they're not two countries anymore. But um, the experiment was done in. Uh, the, you know the, the areas that were formerly Western Germany and Eastern Germany. So I think I think there is a there is an under, you know understanding that more research needs to be done outside the US, but it's not 
The problem is that it's not easy. Cross-cultural research is incredibly difficult. There are so many challenges that it moves at an absolute snail's pace. Um, it's a pretty depressing catalog. The biggest challenge, I think, is the um, publication ecosystem or the academic ecosystem that you'll have. Uh, there's a, you know, everyone probably at this point knows the phrase publish, publish or perish. Mm-hmm. And what, what I've seen in the conferences in, uh, in America is like a lot of research is being done by PhD students because they have a huge pressure to, to publish, uh, uh, therefore get a job. And so what do you do when you, when you really want to, uh, you know, you want to publish a good, good papers that get accepted in good journals, the higher, the better, as quickly as possible. Well, the first, the one thing you don't do is, is do cross-cultural research where the results, results might be a bit messy, a bit complex, a bit hard to explain. It's hard to pull a story out of it, and that makes it difficult to publish. It's a lot easier to do to focus on a monocultural uh, context and try to find a, a main effect, and then you know you, you have something to your name basically. Whereas cross cultural research, or it, it can be inconclusive because you know there's a limited number of things that you can measure in, in in research, and you know you might have inconclusive results because oh you didn't measure the one thing that might be you know make it, making a difference to your results. And uh, there are limited financial resources and time resources and everything. So it's, it's, it's not easy. Mm-hmm. And then on top of that, you need, you need to have connections. You need to have researchers helping you to understand the other cultural context. So for that reason, a lot of the cross-cultural psychology research has been done in between US and China or US and Japan, because some researchers have made that kind of connection. And then one of them returns often, maybe often there are PhD students in the US at the same time, one returns to to, uh, their respective countries, and then they do some research together. Now, what that means is that we know hugely more about the differences between US and China and US and Japan, but virtually nothing about Africa, mm-hmm. virtually nothing. Yeah, uh, the, we, the, it's, it's an absolute sort of like, a, you know, the blank spot on the map of cross cultural psychology. There, there are some studies that are coming out now, but mostly in judgment decision making, nothing social, so, social psychology has some, but not much. South America is also uh, very, very uh, little research coming out there. So it's, um, it, it's, it makes it difficult to to form a sort of a comprehensive picture of what's what's going on and what the differences might be because of that mm-hmm. and then um yeah so even though there, I, th- I think i saw recently i've now forgotten which journal it was but it was one of the one of the big big uh high impact factor journals and the editor specifically the editor changed and they said that they want to put more emphasis on uh studies from non-weird uh some on weird non-weird samples it's, it's great to see that, but it's going to take a long time, a long time because it's so resource intensive. There's one last thing that makes things uh, a bit difficult is that the two, two, let's call them academic worlds or the scientific worlds and mindsets rarely meet. So I've been to lots of Mm cross-cultural psychology conferences. I have never seen uh, a JDM study there, not once. So wow. not what not once. And um, the thing is, that it's mostly uh, it's mostly social psychologists, more research coming out. It's often um, often PhD students who come from China that they do and do their PhD in, in America and they try to do cross cultural JDM research. But the problem is that because they lack that knowledge of what is going on in cross cultural psychology, what's the latest there, the constructs that they use are often outdated so you might see you might see mm-hmm. some jdm stuff that is like posters they never talks notes there are never ever the, the competitive talks they're always posters so um which is interesting in itself but you'll see the posters and they'll use concepts uh, or measurement tools that i i've seen um critiqued and uh, critiqued in cross-cultural psychology uh, like circles and then also superseded already by uh, more up-to-date measurement tools or scales or w- whatnot. So that's the problem is that J- JDM researchers don't go to those uh, those conferences. So they have no idea what the latest is. And I, I don't know, I don't, maybe their supervisors don't either. So there's a big discrepancy. Uh, those those worlds don't really meet. And that's, yeah, that's challenging, uh, especially as you're if you're interested in it, like I am, and I keep talking about it, and then people say, "Well, give me an example." I'm like, 
Well, that, <clears throat> unfortunately, that research doesn't exist yet. Right. We won't ask you that then. You know, it might do or it might not. Who knows? You know, it might exist for, you know, I, I've had this conversation with, uh, with clients sometimes and people ask, oh, so can you give me an example of, you know, some, some phenomena in, uh, in country X? In this case, there isn't a Rolodex or any kind of library that you can dip, it, <laughs> dip into and go, ah, I want to compare France and uh, Guatemala and uh, on a topic X. Like we haven't mapped out human behavior like mm. that. And uh, trying to bring together decision making psychology and, and cultural psychology. It's like herding cats. It's a bit like that. Yeah. All right. <laughs> it sounds like this research on cultural psychology whether it's out there or not, if there's no central place, you know, for it to be communicated or compared against other research, similar research, you know, to look at replicability, look at effects, then it, it's basically, mm -hmm. you know, if a tree falls in a forest and there's no one there to hear it, did it even fall? Pretty much. Yeah. So we, we, need, Pretty yeah, much, we yeah. need to really have some sort of structure and system in place before we can really expand our knowledge on cultural psychology. Yeah, yeah, I think I uh, some some JDM researchers have raised this as well. These papers are now, I don't know, maybe at least 10 years old. So I think it's Elka Weber and uh, someone else could be Eric Johnson. But um, they they did uh, a review of uh, the state of sort of a state of cultural psychology within JDM. And uh, the, one of the things that they, they noticed that what is holding it back is kind of being able to import frameworks or using frameworks to sh systematically study um, study ju judgment, you know, judgment, decision making research or decision making in general with the frameworks from cultural psychology. And because the frameworks they're not being used, then the findings are very scattered. There are, you know, there's a little bit of this, a little bit of that. People use different measures, different constructs, different DBs. It, it is like that herding cats. It's pears and apples and, you know, cherries and tomatoes. It's just like, it's just like, oh, here's some results on that. And then some of that. And then, you know, you, it's it's very, very difficult to conclusively say. What we do know is that, that um, that Americans and Westerners in Westerners, but Americans in particular, are uh, quite often outliers. That much we know, but we don't really know the rest. Wow. I mean, that has depressing. That has real. It's depressing. That seriously has real implications for being able to even use any behavioral science, you know, appropriately. If if this bias yeah. exists, and if yeah. we know that the you know, the sample in which we are producing a lot of this knowledge is an outlier, it's not generalizable. That's that's huge. Yeah. And, and the, the problem is that we, you know, we don't know what we don't know. So uh, imagine that I, you know, I'm, I'm a little bit concerned that you have that we have these blockbuster behavioral, uh, behavioral science, pop science books that are translated into, you know, 50 different languages, you know, someone in a in country X picks it up and tries to apply it and go, hang on, hang on that doesn't work here at all. So and, and a good, well, a good example of so in the West, we tend to see this is something that that all three of us will take for granted. Like we'll we'll probably you know nod it nod even if not physically then on the inside. Uh, let's say that if a person who is very strongly swayed by other people's opinions is not, but we don't really look kindly on those types of people. Is that like, you know or you know if you always do, if you always do what everyone in your family wants to do, you're you know basically a lot of people will say you're a bit of a doormat. You know, that's that's that we tend to see we we tend to see that you know if you don't stick to your own own preferences, your own likes, your values, whatever, um, and if you change your behavior according to what other people do, then you know mm, we don't look kindly on that. That's a bit of a character flaw in in some ways. So, but that's because we see social norms as being something outside of ourselves. Our preferences our preferences are personal, and social norms are sort of a, an external thing that hovers around there and may or may not influence us. But then uh, there's some research by, um, by Sharon Shabit uh, from, uh, I think she's at the University of Illinois. And she's done a fair bit of research on, on this topic. Uh, the, the paper is actually called Preferences Need Not Be Personal. The point of the paper and her research is that in non-Western countries, actually specifically, let's, let's pick a more specific example, um, Japan. Other people's preferences are not something that's external. It's there isn't really a strong separation between what you want and what you know or think other people want, because what you want is already uh, sort of mixed up with what you know other people want. 
And that sounds so, you know, as much as I know that, I've, I've read that so many times and I know that consciously and rationally, I find it just mind blowing because I cannot imagine what it's like. You constantly keep track of what everyone else thinks and then you adapt your behavior in countries like Japan. Uh, let's pick Japan because like my example um, coming up is, is for a Japanese friend. Um, you're, you value that kind of group harmony, belonging, relationships more than uh, sticking to your own values and your beliefs and what you want. And I, I had a very personal experience of this uh, some years ago. I had a, a Japanese friend. We lived in London and um, we went on a little little holiday together. And on one morning I asked her, so, Mickey, what do you want to do today? Today? And she said uh, she was also a cross-cultural psychologist, so uh, she was uh, unusually articulate about, about this and analysing herself. And she said, you know, Alina, it's really weird that I can't tell you what I want to do today before I know what you want to do today. And it's just, it just it, it just blows my mind. And, she, you know, she was, uh, yeah, she was pretty analytical about it because she knew the concepts and she knew that. And she still, you know, she's, she's explained it that, um, in Japan, it's like you're conscious, constantly aware of what other people want to do and what they prefer and so on. And that's actually, you know, you take that into account already when you're behaving. And to me, as a, you know, as a very clearly a, a Westerner, and especially I'm from Finland, so we're um, also in that kind of, you know, sort of individualistic um, camp. To me, that sounds exhausting. Mm -hmm. Imagine just like, you know, uh, imagine that thinking constantly keeping track of what everyone else wants and then adapting your behavior to that. Whereas for her, that was automatic. I'm actually quite curious. So, uh, I mean, a, a very uh, easy shortcut to obviously having more research that is non-weird, if you will, yeah. is to run similar type of research that has been predominantly done in America, some of it, of course, in Europe. And to actually take that to, of course, other cultures, other countries. But when it comes to the measurement itself and how we build our frameworks and how we've built the interventions or the, the type of research and experimental stuff that we run, isn't that inherently biased by weird itself? Mm. Like, are these the right measures to run? Like, will they run properly in other cultures? <laughs> because obviously for these type of papers, it's very important to produce good results yeah. or shocking results or at least something that's publishable. But what if it is the tool itself that's already flawed? What then? Yeah, I mean that's the that that's the big question, and I, and and I I don't have an answer to that. I don't know when if we'll ever have an answer to that. But um, just thinking about it logically, if the majority of uh, research is being done by weird researchers, then you know inadvertently <laughs> it's it's not even it's not even conscious, but uh, effectively most research researchers in this field that we we're sort of focusing on are weird. So we have, you know, we, we already see the world uh, in, in this kind of like, you know, personal preferences. You can see that in JDM research, that huge amount of it is focused on choice, individual choice. And what influences that? And especially, I mean, it's really, uh, this is a bit of a bit of an anecdote, but I find that maybe it's easier to, to see them in context. I hadn't really it was just something I couldn't really put my finger on until some years ago I was in San Francisco and I was trying to get a bagel and a morning coffee and um, and before I could get actually pay and get my breakfast I had probably accounted maybe 12 13 decisions and I, I, you know it's amazing that I was I just wanted a coffee and a bagel and there so that really made me think that the way that American society and uh, American culture works it values individual choice more than almost anything else. And you can see it play out now in, in like the coronavirus discussions as well. There's, you know, that that comes up quite a lot. And I, so I realized like, no wonder that that choice is such a, you know, what influences choice is such a big, big area of, of the research that we, we look at because choice is so big. It's central to, to American lifestyle. Whereas, you know, if I compare that trying to get a coffee and a you know sort of pastry type product if you go to Italy there is one type of coffee available in the morning this is the coffee that you have this Sunday morning if you're a, you know if you're a stupid tourist and you want a cappuccino in the morning it's like that's you, you'll get you'll get you'll get <laughs> no. some weird looks like uh, no this is what we have in the morning and that is it so it's not like you can have this you know you know five different sizes and different supplements do you want some this milk or that milk it's like no this is what we have you take it or leave it and then no one really questions that mm. so it's you know what impact that has I, 
we can't measure that, what impact that has on the research. But if you think about it, like you will consider choices totally differently if your everyday life is full of them, whereas if you have fewer every day, it's it's just um you know it's the problem with culture is it's uh it it makes a significant and makes a difference to how we live our lives, but it's like the air we breathe, so it's very difficult to see it, or it's it's like it you know whatever feels natural, it's only natural because it's it's what you're used to. So it's very, very difficult to to measure it, to conceptualize it and operationalize it. So that's um, that's one problem. But then, so going back to specifically what impact it has on the research that we use, then the way that science, it, psychological science in particular, is set up is this analytic mode of thinking that is very typical with independent so, uh, social orientation or independent social orientation is is the sort of personal level of measurement for individualistic countries. Indiv- individualism and collectivism are sort of country level uh, macro measurements. And then on an individual level is sort of an independent social orientation uh, and an in- interdependent. There's a lot more to that, but let's just, uh, you know, th- let's use this like characterization. And so independent mindsets or modes of thought, independent social orientation tends to come with an analytic mode of thinking, which is more linear. And we assume that, you know, behavior is determined by internal attributes like our, our, our traits, our values and so on. Not the situation, which is like, which is the opposite of the holistic mode of thinking that you interpret people's behavior based on the context and situational factors. We like to analytic thinking likes to isolate objects from the background and kind of you know basically look at them and evaluate them separately that's exactly how scientific research works that's exactly how experiments are done so you know our whole the way the way that we approach experiments experimental research is it is (laughs) fundamentally a western way of thinking now can we get away from that what would be uh you know what would be the opposite i have no idea It's it's a much bigger question that i can I can answer but once you once you start thinking about it it's almost like oh i wish i i wish i could unsee that and uh just just not know it would be a lot easier if you if you hadn't if i hadn't thought of that like mm, okay uh so, same thing goes for think, things like um like uh liquor mm-hmm. like the, those scales all of the scales that we mm-hmm. typically use for measurement but they they all originate in america so they they originate in uh, in things like uh, like market research industry like polling and so on. So a guy guy just one day decided that this is how we're going to measure things from you know uh, how much do you agree with this uh, from scale, you know scale of one to ten or whatever that is. We don't actually know whether that is a good way of measuring how sure. you know people's behavior. Mm-hmm. It's just that someone came up with it and then you know 50, 60 years later that's what everyone uses and we just go along with it. I don't know. It's uh, it, it's yeah. it's interesting. I'm not surprised. Yeah, we kind of just need to hit reset on the whole on every epistemology <laughs> we currently <laughs> use. Yeah, no big deal, right? Yeah, no big deal. Yeah, no, that's yeah. a small change. Yeah, like. it's easy. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it, it should be easy enough to get people from all over the world, from all types of different cultures together in the room, have a quick think tank and be like, OK, so this is what we used to have. Everyone's still in favor. Yes. Yep. No. OK, yep. throw it out. You've got 24 hours to come up with something else. We'll publish yeah. it. Moving on. Just yeah, reinvent yeah, exactly. the whole field. Just, just, reinvent just the whole thing. Everything in the bin over there in that, in that <laughs> cupboard and then start from scratch. And it's like, yeah, the incentives are not really stacked that way. So um Free yeah. not. It worries me, though. I don't think I've I've done research so far, which is even uh, somewhat generalizable to 1.8 billion people in the world. So it makes me, <laughs> makes me worried for the future. It makes me very worried. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Well, it's, 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 okay. it's, it's not your fault. Not very optimistic podcast. No. No, it, it is what it is, but it is it is very honest. And uh, I mean, Sarah and I did start this podcast to uh, to learn more about you know behavioral science, and then of course also the, you know there is a lot of good stuff in behavioral science, and there is a lot of angles to behavioral science that either uh, aren't very well discussed or are you know quite um, consciously repressed. And I do think the fact that behavioral science is incredibly weird and predominantly yeah. white and Western and you know, whatever the rest of the acronym stands for, that that is, you know, not generalizable globally. And I think most people, if they stopped to think about this for three seconds, would most definitely recognize this. 
But as you've mentioned before, the incentive structure for changing this uh, is non-existent, if not yeah. contrarian. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, the American universities, uh, the top ones, especially the the Ivy League ones, have so much resource, like financial resources, to to do the research mm. that there is. It's very, very hard to beat them. Even you know, um, so like I said, I'm I'm originally from Finland, and when I mention the the type of resources that I I've seen people have, like you have you have research assistants, you have lab managers, all that kind of stuff. I, I know full, full professors in Finland who do all of their own fieldwork and they do all of their own analysis. There is no money to do. And this, this is not like, a you know, that, I mean, Finland is very small, but if I extrapolate that to how many universities there might be in Africa, that you mm -hmm. might have some smart, talented people and you have no resources whatsoever to do anything on the kind of scale that that you might have in the US. So it's kind of it, it's, it's just uh, the odds are stacked against it. But. Yeah, I I feel like we should we're, we're we've got a very negative uh, note going on. It's not all you know. It's not just about uh, Americans. Uh, the research all based on Americans. That's that's not even the you know. Th there's another side to this, which is that uh, doing do, doing uh, trying to replicate some of the research in in other cultural contexts can be hugely illuminating on what are the process and processes in the background. Because if it, if it doesn't replicate then that's really interesting. It's, it's not just about like, well, we have this bunch of findings. Do they replicate? Can we use it? Uh, you know, can we use it as a practitioner? I always think, can I, you know, can I use these insights somewhere? So that's that's how I look at it. But um, the question isn't just, does this replicate from for the sake of replicating it? The question is, can we find out something? Can we learn something new about hum how the human mind works by replicating it somewhere else? And when it doesn't work, mm. that's really interesting. Um, so I think I think there's a that's the other side of it that is, uh, is I think is more sort of a positive, more constructive note that we're you know it, it, there's a there's a lot of knowledge to be gained from doing that and seeing uh, what might be the dynamics, what might be the drivers of of different uh, yeah you know behavioral phenomena. And I'm a big believer in that a null result can be as interesting as a, as a positive, significant result. So. We just yeah. need to find a journal that's going to publish mm -hmm. them. Yeah, yeah, or, yeah. Oh, yeah. Good luck. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and I mean, I mean, uh, also, it's not all about differences. We we do we, we it would be really valuable to know that you know oh so this this finding holds in these countries. The fact that they are the same is equally interesting. It's not just about like oh we must find differences. Yeah, that makes it for a more interesting publication, obviously, you know, but that's why a lot of the cross-cultural psychology research is focused on differences between US and China, US and Japan, because you pick the sort of, you, the people try to pick the maximally different countries or cultural contexts, so you can you can see the differences, uh, you know, you get some significance levels out of the, the differences, but, um, but that's also misleading because then we're just focusing on the polar opposites for the sake of... Uh, yeah. Whereas it would be quite interesting now. Okay, so let's let's try. You know, country U.S. and Canada. Like where you know that often the closest, um, the ones that are uh, culturally closest in some ways, uh, seeing if there's a difference there. That's quite interesting as well. So um, yeah, I think finding the similarities and really sort of mapping it out. That's that is really interesting. But I think it will take another ten years, mm -hmm. probably twenty, uh, to to make significant process. It's it's slow, and I think. I think you need people who get tenure to be more brave and, and do that kind of stuff. So you need this, you know, this younger generation that has grown up or grown up or academically grown up with with this knowledge and this the, these these ideas to then really yeah. make a, a big difference. So, yeah. But yeah, we, well, there's more stuff coming out, but it's um, yeah, it'll take time. You say that there has been made progress. So when I'm thinking, mm -hmm. and especially because it's been in the last 10 years, when I think of this type of uh, cross-cultural type of, you know, research and that progressing and people showing more of an interest in that, do you think that might actually be driven by the fact that there is a larger variety of the type of academics that become, well, that become academics, that become associate professors, researchers, and maybe even potentially get tenure? Because I can imagine that 10 years ago, and especially even much before that, that you know, the, the stereotype of an old white male academic is a stereotype that still persists. And maybe as we get more variety in what now becomes professor or professional researcher, if you will, that they might actually drive this research. Is is that a fair assumption? 
That is a, that's a really good point. And actually, I think you're spot on because what I've um, what I've sort of casually anecdotally observed is from the time when I first went to the, the like SJDM and, and those conferences, you could see that there were, um, there were quite a lot of PhD students uh, from various Asian countries. Not, you know, uh, often I think um, the comparison you might have had people from South Korea, you might have had um, not so many, not so many Japanese, but often from China and South Korea. And, um, and in the time from from then to now, I sometimes see, you know, occasionally see people uh, like moving, you know, that people move back to uh, back to China or South Korea. And then you start, start, start to see the research coming out that is these collaborations, the friendships that, you know, we shouldn't under, underestimate the, the role of informal friendships and relationships that get formed when people do their PhDs and do graduate school at the same time. And then, you know, uh, that you, you do research with people you know or that you, that you like and you know how to work with them. And then, you, you know, you, so I think that's quite a nice optimistic note uh, as well that I think, yeah, things yeah, will change. Yeah. To do. I mean, I, I can see yeah. anec- anecdotally yeah. within my own discipline, so experimental economics, that there's emerging this uh, dichotomization that you talked about between comparing US and Indian populations, which has just largely been driven mm-hmm. by the fact that um, online experimental tools like Amazon MTurk have access to yeah. Indian populations and American populations. So I guess yeah. another piece of the puzzle is trying yeah. to get get access and provide access to a wider range of researchers to populations within other cultures and other countries. Yeah, absolutely. And actually, it's really, it's, it's quite interesting, um, you know, uh, every cloud has a silver lining. And I think that there's a one, oh, this is going to sound trivial, but... Um, <sighs> From the but since we're talking about behavioral science, let's let's say there's a behavioral science silver lining in uh, the you know coronavirus pandemic that you, there's I think I've I've seen a I think it counted about 230 different research studies running at the same time, mm-hmm. uh, or running right now or being run or be, you know uh, in different stages of publications, and um, and a lot of those studies are across multiple countries. Mm. So I think when that comes out, there's there will be uh quite a lot of material mm, it'll be from different angles but um maybe that maybe this is um i think this is an interesting event from uh from the perspective of psychology and especially cross-cultural psychology let's leave aside all the other aspects that we, we you know there are but we're talking about behavioral science so let's focus on that i i think it's been there's there's never really been an event or an experience that everyone in the world has has had to go through almost at the same time so what we can see is that people react uh people governments and citizens and people have reacted to this very differently it seems to kind of reflect what we know from cross-cultural psychology so you'll see asia you we've all seen uh how asian many asian countries moved swiftly to uh to, to take action and a lot of them were quite restrictive um, restrictive uh, actions and uh, particularly somewhere like let's pick Singapore. Uh, Singapore is very 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 small so it's obviously a bit of an outlier in that sense but Singaporeans uh, have uh, they, they, they're sort of used to well if, if necessary put the common good ahead of themselves so in this case be, having personal freedoms restricted is accepted because that is the only way we're going to get through this. As there, as they're always the case with the cross-cultural comparisons, there are you know a dozen variables uh, you know in play at the same time. But for the sake of the conversation, the reaction to restrictive measures in China is much more readily expect, accepted. Obviously, there's a history of doing that, so that's, that's one thing. But um, you know, hi- history, culture, uh, how people interact with institutions is you know it is part of how, uh, that shapes our, how we think as well. When you compare that to country uh, Anglo-Saxon countries like particularly UK and the US, you could see that there was a delay in in taking action. And actually, um, there was a quote by uh, Boris Johnson was quoted in uh, one of the in an article where he he says something like that it's your inalienable uh, ancient inalienable right to go to the pub. And a bunch of other stuff that he says that it's, okay. he, he kind of he kind of really makes visible the assumption that you know independent mindset 
that your rights, your personal rights are the most important things in the world. And, you know, governments make decisions partly based on what they think is acceptable to citizens and yeah. what people will will accept. So and the, the most individualistic Anglo-Saxon countries were the slowest to react to this. I mean, there is obviously the, the you know, we could talk uh, another hour about sure. the quality of politicians, <laughs> but that's a, you know, <laughs> there's a, you know, there's a, that's a totally different conversation. Um, but it's it's very interesting to see that you know the West, like even in Europe, the more uh, the more individualistic countries, the more developed countries struggled with imposing these restrictions. Whereas you've got, uh, I have friends uh, friends from Poland, from Czech Republic, who said that, that basically no problem. It's not a problem. It's it wasn't a problem at all. They had restrictions and people. Had, yep. Got it. We've had these before. And uh, like my Polish friend said that we know how this works, that, you know, when there's a when there's a threat, you follow instructions because that saves lives. And, you know, we the history of the, the memory of uh, being under Russian rule is still so close that sacrificing individual rights or individual preferences for a common good is still um, is more is more salient than whereas both Netherlands and France, they kind of let things go on a bit longer. And especially, I think, in France, again, I don't remember the exact quote, but it was something about that Smurf event that, you know, did you do you know that there was a there was a, like thousands and thousands of people took part in I'm a, sorry, what? a Smurf event? Yep. <laughs> you uh, do mean yep, the, the, yeah, the all, little blue people? Uh, yes, I do. Those are Smurfs. Yep. Yep. Okay. The people dressing up as Smurfs. Yep. There was a, a massive event. It was in the news that they let, okay. let that go ahead in France. And it was almost like uh, I think people were saying who, who attended like, yeah, no, you know, we we want to do this and this is, it's our right to do this. So it's you know, there are plenty of quotes that you, once you know what you're looking for, you can see it in people's quotes and how they talk about it. It's like my individual rights are being sacrificed uh, for the common good. And that's, you know, to some extent, people do accept that. But this is a very extreme situation. Deep down, I think there are there are still a lot of people who are like, mm, it's, re- it's it's really difficult to accept that. And um, yeah, so it, it, it it's it's funny how you can see it play out. But yeah, others recently, I think it was this week uh, that you see there have been pictures or videos of of protests in America where people are just like, well, I have the right, I have the right to work. Mm-hmm. And it's a it's very much the opposite of it's all me. Yeah. I you know I have the right, not what is the common good. And you know there is no right or wrong here. Like there is no right or wrong in, in general sense in this particular situation. There probably <laughs> is a better you know better choices than where there worse ones in terms of consequences. But in general, uh, general basis, like there is it's one thing isn't worse than the other. Like focusing on yourself uh, or like prioritizing yourself versus prioritizing the you know the the common good. Mm-hmm. It's it, there's no right or wrong in that sense, but it's interesting to see how that plays out. Uh, you know how people's reactions to the same event, same experience, are so different. And um, I've been wanting to write about this, but I sort of want to see, uh, you know, wait and see a little bit longer before you know making a. There's so many speculations about on on Corona, what's going to happen, this and that. And I I don't know whether it's it's better to wait and uh, to have more confidence, like this is what actually happened rather than speculate but it's i've just been watching with with interest like hmm, okay um it, it's interesting how it plays out and uh sort of reflects what what cross-cultural psychologists would know but imagine that there there are very few cultural psychology experts in in any kind of government mm. behavioral insights teams so um that isn't that again is is not really reflected i think amazing so yeah Ideally, what would you like to see uh, in behavioral science when it comes to taking culture into account? What would be the the ideal mm. endpoint for you, or at least a good stage of transition? What I would like to see more of is this kind of, uh, I suppose, a bit of humility on behalf of uh, both both behavioral scientists doing the research, um, and then also, uh, well, my world is practitioners, so especially practitioners taking that into account and having you know admitting that uh, it could just be like admitting that we don't know we don't know we, we'll need to think about this and not just uh you know uh, implicitly assume is is almost always implicitly um and kind of take an interest in this and think about like okay so what could be dimensions of uh my own culture that that might blind me to this and and having more of that uh I don't know, a little pinch of um, 
imposter syndrome I suppose like I guess you know like having a little bit of that like like sense of yeah I don't know what I don't know um or we, 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 a little bit less confidence in you know this is definitely how people do it less less sort of prescriptive and and kind of taking a step back going hmm maybe let's you know let's see and 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 also when you write about something when you write about a particular effect or or uh, some results or whatever it is that you want to talk about have a little look around uh, has anything uh, has anything been published recently or uh, that might suggest like that there is differences between cultures because like i said it's, it's hard to stick you know hard to keep up with a moving target but every time you write about it have a little look around what's been published recently is there something that you should you know um you should know about i mean i guess it you know i always uh, i always think that it's good to look at meta analyses and and uh, like reviews of the literature before you make some conclusions and at least have a look around is there is there a meta analysis to to know that um uh, maybe having a a bit of that that kind of uh humility and um less of the assuming that we you know we we know how things work and we know how people mm. think because we you know there's a, there's so much to learn if if there's anything i've I've sort of learned in the past 10 years is is uh, this kind of um, anxiety attack inducing feeling of like, there's so much I don't know. Mm-hmm. Like the more, the more I know, the more it's like, uh, you know, this kind of like emotional hyperventilation of, or intellectual hyperventilation, like I, there's so much I don't know. How can you say anything about anything? Because- yeah, I don't think I've related to anything more than what you've just said on a personal <laughs> level. Yeah, that really resonates. Mm -hmm. (laughs) and I guess you may have already covered this in your last answer but if nothing else what do you think listeners should take away from this episode what would be your key message Hmm. what would be my key key message well I think it's very simply we're everyone who's listening to this I, I I I'm guessing will be just a just a bunch of weirdos like the three of us like but there is it's very very difficult mm-hmm. to escape your own cultural mindset and your cultural upbringing incredibly difficult i've been reading about these things for 10 years and uh like my fr- like conversation with my japanese friend um on a conscious level a rational level i know that that is a you know that's how other people think and i still find it mind-boggling like how can you do that it's just having that um <laughs> That he- that very healthy sense of doubt that you know we are we are potentially pretty unusual in how we think uh, and how we how we perceive things um, and that most people are probably not like us. So uh, yeah, I think always have a bit of empathy and like like this seems irrational or illogical to me, but that might be because you know we are pretty unusual. Uh, so yeah, I think I think that's really what you can take away from it and. Um, the other part of it is that uh, the answer with behavioral science literature and knowledge is almost always it depends. Right. It's all relative, but we're a bunch yeah. of weirdos. Yeah, that's pretty much it. Yeah. <laughs> very, very well said. <laughs> I like that. Excellent. Um, and if the listener wants to keep up with what you're doing, is there any way that they can find you on the internet? Uh, yes. So you can find me on LinkedIn. I, I'm probably most active on LinkedIn. So if you just look up Alina Hallinan and you'll probably see something about, yeah, you'll probably find me there quite easily. I am also on Twitter. Uh, it's on um, Twitter. It's a uh, square peg mind. And I do have a website. It's a uh, square peg insights, um, which is all about sort of not fitting in where you are and I, I've always felt culturally a bit of a square peg because I've lived in different countries and you know just trying to fit into that round hole in different, <laughs> in different places so or is that uh, is it right yeah yeah square yeah square peg in a round hole so that's where that comes from really Perfect. so yeah you can find me you can find me that way yeah <laughs> All right. So we just had an absolutely amazing talk with Elena. Again, Elena, thank you so much. But Mm -hmm. what is it that we've actually learned today? Sarah, would you like to start us off? Well, I I really enjoyed our conversation with Elena. I thought it was incredibly illuminating. Um, And really what's kind of stood out for me is that as researchers and as practitioners of behavioral science, no matter who you are, we have this responsibility to be reflexive about you know our own perspectives and how that shapes the research and insights that we produce you know and any behavioral science you know user or practitioner or researcher will tell you that behavioral science is incredibly context dependent you know that isn't 
uh, a controversial thing to say. But what I think we don't hear a lot of necessarily is um, how our role as researchers can impact the not only the design of research, but also sort of the assumptions that we're bringing um, to the research project and our sort of interpretation. I do think it's a little bit like Pandora's box, sort of opening our eyes to cultural biases that we have. They're sort of invisible and ingrained and innate and very difficult to, you know, actually identify within ourselves. So it's it there is there is no easy solution for this, but I guess the the first step and something that's quite actionable for us to do is to at least talk about this bias and be critical of research under this lens. You know, actually come into research with a little bit more, as Alina said, you know, scepticism. You know, is this a, a result that is driven primarily because of culture? Is this a research question that is driven primarily by our sort of cultural expectations and beliefs? You know, it, it doesn't matter if, if it is, you know, because it, it, we can't separate culture from our perspectives. It's sort of, it's, I don't think that is, that is the aim. What should be the goal is to try to recontextualize research through different perspectives. Uh, and I think that's only going to happen when, you know, research communities and practitioner communities and behavioral science becomes more inclusive. So it, it, it'll be a win-win, right? We get to hear more voices, we get to be a bit critical of research that has come before, and through that we get to expand our knowledge uh, in behavioral science and improve the application of insights from the discipline. Sure. Yeah, I, I kind of feel the same way where I'm like, I, I was aware of weird, um, especially as we as we mentioned before, we started interviewing Elina, that we know our samples are, are highly unrepresentative of the population yeah. at large. But now I'm starting to, to worry that once I, I publish out my research, um, as a, quite a few people know, I'm, a, I'm actually really, really pro cash and I'm against a lot of other uh, more uh, e money payment types but now i'm actually starting to worry that the type of advice mm. that i'm giving as an academic is actually really useful for some and very detrimental to others and when that's that is allowed within something that claims to be you know academic and you know it claims to be a science or behavioral science at least if we for if we allow for this type of dichotomy mm -hmm. What is the justification of the science actually being called a yeah. science? If you're not able to generalize your findings, if you're not able to properly write global policy, if you will, on what you have found, then what is the value of your work? Well, it, I guess it's the difference between internal validity and external validity, right? Sure. So I guess the stuff that we have done so far, you know, the stuff that's replicable, that um, is sort of systematic, that can be reproduced, it has internal validity. But I think what people aren't really talking about or taking into account or even, you know, adding a disclaimer to is that the stuff that we know it potentially is only true for populations from weird countries. Um, and I think we're in, in, in an incredibly difficult position where even if we started to do more cross-cultural research or we started to, you know, focus more on, um, you know, behavior in other populations that are non-weird, we're still potentially going to be coming um, at the research from a Western perspective, you know, with the Western mm. tools, with the Western paradigms that we already have, we sort of take for granted. So, I mean, I don't really know what the solution is apart from just, you know, hitting reset. <laughs> I don't think we can hit reset. I mean, we, we've already discussed this and it, it, we know that the, uh, the incentivization structure for publishing is to have predominantly American data because the uh, the, the heavyweight journals are either American-based or they predominantly have American editors. So mm -hmm. with such an incentivization structure, I just hope that within, you know, a couple of generations time, and that's not me being optimistic, that's me being pessimistic, that we have people who don't come from a weird background um, mm -hmm. And, and I do mean the acronym. You can come from whatever background you'd like. Um, 
but hopefully not Western, not industrialized, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, and that these people get given an just more of a chance to have to have their research out there, but to also put mm. these type of people and I just sound like a, a pro discrimination advocate by this or positive discrimination advocate by this stage. But to have people in these positions of power, because the journal editor, that, that is a position of power, where they're just not weird. I just, I'm, I'm tired of these, like, old white men. Like, I, do, I'm, I mean, I do mean offense. I do. I, like, I'm not even going to say, like, <laughs> you know, I'm so sorry. I'm not sorry. Get out. I want the more yeah. diverse. I need more diversity in research. And if there is, like, you know, St. Peter at the gate is an old white American male, well, that's not going to fucking help, is it? No, probably not. I mean, like any bias, the first thing to do is to become aware of it. Sure. You know, like it's yep. if you're not aware of your bias, you, you can't do anything to adjust your behavior or, you know, to change the way that you view the world. So. It's 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 difficult. I find it difficult to I mean, it, it is very clear what the problem is. And like you said, it, the best thing to do would to, would be to hit reset, get a bunch of um, experts together or at least people who are aware of what's going on in certain types of, of fields, be that, you know, the psychology of money, behavioral change, um, ego depletion, mm. scarcity analysis, like God knows what, yeah. whatever it might be. Get a bunch of people together, a bunch of weirdos, a bunch of non-weirdos, and then actually reevaluate what you think is going on and what are the tools that we use are actually bias whether the results that we know exist are biased and probably the answer to all of those is yes they are biased and then recreate them just just wipe them out wipe them out and improve them from all perspectives or or even just trying to get people to to rethink the tools and assumptions that we take for granted you know like uh elena said even the likert scale which Mm. is something that is just the automatic you know response field you'd put in a survey in, oh, in yeah. an experimental survey you know it's it's taken for granted it's the basic bitch of scales it really is right yeah but just even trying to come up with new ways of collecting responses or even mm. is a survey you know is are there other ways that you can approach the problem outside of you know the frameworks that we already have you know yeah. so it's but I, I think it's going to I think it's going to require a lot more non weirdos uh, in order for us to make much progress on this. I think even if we have a whole bunch of non weird people here who do come from different backgrounds, for them to be taken seriously, they'd have to go to institutions which are very very highly ranked, which are predominantly weird. And then to actually make it in the field, they'd have to stick to, especially at the start of an academic career, if you want to be an academic researcher, the line that you have to follow is quite clear. There, there, is, there is a bunch of paths, but the, they're also very, very similar paths. And the type of research that you do is going to be relatively quick, not very controversial, easy to publish, and then controversial and easy to publish. They, they kind of hammer each other out. Mm. So... The last thing you're going to do, and even even if you have come to that university to to expose the weirdness of behavioral science, the last thing you're going to do is run incredibly expensive cross-cultural studies that might lead to results which are hard to interpret, difficult yeah. to sell, and as such, almost impossible to publish. And if you won't do it as a PhD, maybe you'll do it later in life. Hoping that Amazing. the system that the, yeah, hoping that you haven't completely internalized the, the system and the rat race that you're in, and that is a really really pessimistic way of ending this episode. But weird is real, people. Weird is real. Yeah, yeah. and uh, and I'll never be the same. <laughs> yeah, I feel I feel exposed and chewed up and spat out by my own weirdness. <laughs> And if you're still with us, thank you so much for listening. Uh, we hope that you enjoyed the episode, even if you know you feel a bit sad like we are right now. Yeah. Uh, we still hope that you learned something and that it was interesting. And we'd love to hear from you via all of our social media uh, about what you thought and about whether or not you can think of any other solutions to this huge problem uh, that we haven't thought of. 
especially if you're non-weird. If you're non-weird, yes. please do let us know how do you approach behavioral signs and are there any suggestions that you would make? Is it going to be a reset button and just a complete startup as if we're living in some type of a Rawlsian society? Shout out to everyone who gets that philosophical reference. And uh, yeah, just, just let us know how you feel about it, especially as a non-weird person, because unsurprisingly, Sarah and I are weird, and it is quite difficult mm -hmm. for us to take that perspective. So please do let us know. Yeah, we're trying. We are. <laughs> so that is it for today. Sound off on the socials, and we hope to see you in the next one. Thanks so much for joining us for this episode of Questioning Behaviour. Tune in to our next episode You're to find out which behavior we will be questioning next. A podcast is a bit of a one-way medium. We're talking to you, but you can't actually talk back. If you'd like a more interactive exchange, do reach out to us via our socials. You can follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn. Just look for Questioning Behavior. We're also on Twitter using at QB underscore podcast. We're looking forward to hearing from you. See ya. Bye.